we'll stay as a group. If anybody wants to leave, feel free. Um, and we'll answer individual questions. Too. Yeah. Uh, I've been on a local zoning board now for three years. And we've gotten a whole series of requests for variances of uh, lot lines, or the uh, distance between a lot line and the structure, changes in use. If we grant these or we deny them, are we setting any kind of precedent that at some point that was one of your cases. the uh, the court is going to say to us, wait a minute, you know, you folks have allowed so many of these exceptions in that particular zone that those rules no longer apply. Are there cases on this? Are there gut feels, or <laughs> is each one of them a separate case and that does I mean, technically I guess they don't set precedent for another one? But at some point, does the court say it was, hey, wait a minute, you know, well, that's right, yes, they should. Peter had sent around, sent around a question is, what case says that? I mean, it's, it's long been my belief that that's true, that, 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 that you're not strictly bound by precedent. But I think, uh, it, 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 you know, I was not able to answer his question as to what case exactly says that. Right. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's sort of implied that, that if, if you think that a board two years ago uh, made a mistake in its reasoning, uh, you are not doomed to repeat that same reasoning. I mean, you, you know, your, your, if your decision is appealed, it'll be judged according to the reasoning that you use. Uh, and, you know, in fact, in, uh, in the case of uh, Nestor versus Meredith, which I cite all the time when, when defending these cases, uh, Justice Batchelder said that, you know, two different boards in two different towns could make uh, could have the same case and make two two opposite decisions and both be upheld because of the the uh, degree of deference that you have the thing that you do have to worry about i think one is uh, from a legal perspective if i think if you do uh, treat people differently and don't have a good reason for doing that you could risk an equal protection claim right or a an administrative gloss type of claim. New Hampshire has this document called administrative gloss, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's ever been applied in the context of relief granted by a zoning board. It's usually on interpretation by the administrative official or the planning board, or the administrative officials. And the difference is that the zoning board is intended as a relief valve. Therefore, its decisions usually are very fact-specific but if you've got two cases that are, you know, really, really close, you're running into potential problems <coughs> with what's called equal protection. E equal protection simply means you've got people that are reasonably the same in the same situation. And you can treat them differently, but if you do, <coughs> there's a higher level of test that is applied. Normally, in a land use case, um, in, in a case like that, <coughs> is, is there a valid public purpose for what you're doing, and is that rationally related to achieving that purpose that you've done? The, the standard for equal protection is a higher, okay? There ha it, it doesn't have to be a compelling <coughs> interest, but it has to be a, not just a public interest, but you're furthering a substantial interest, and that's a somewhat higher level that you have to meet. So there is no rule that says you did this in one case you got to do it in another case but if you're doing it and the cases are similar there ought to be a reason why I think, I think another another aspect of it is is not not entirely 100 percent a legal reason which but but it's a it's a political one if you're perceived to be doing different things for different people then you're going to charge you know you're, you lose credibility right and with with your with your public perception of, of being impartial yeah. and uh, I mean we all know that in Massachusetts is who you are <laughs> <laughs> well the, the, the uh, for anybody can get up here. <laughs> the, the uh, I'm sorry we're, we're spending too much time answering this question but there, there, the, uh, uh, there was an Enfield case where uh, which I also like to cite uh, where, where uh, because the Supreme Court was mixed up about what what standard to use for unnecessary hardship during those years that this case was decided. It was decided on the spirit of the ordinance test. And Chief Justice Broderick uh, said that 
that an important aspect of Spear of the Ordnance Test is, is not just what, what would be the con public consequences of granting this one variance, but also what would be the cumulative impact of a number of similar variances. So it, in that way as well, you're, I mean, you're not setting a precedent, but you're trying to reach a decision which you wouldn't mind setting as a precedent. Uh, in looking at the cumulative effect, and that, and that is a valid reason for uh, under the spirit of the ordinance test. So then if you put six or seven variances together, you've now changed the neighborhood, so the zoning is no longer valid then. Well, and, that, and that, that gets to the Belanger case, which is if the, if the neighborhood is, has changed so much that the restriction you're, the, that you're trying to enforce no longer makes any sense in the, in the character, current character of the neighborhood, that can itself be a reason for granting variance. Right. Uh, there's, I've, I've done a number of cases like that where uh, the Belanger case it was out of Nashua, and there was a neighborhood in Nashua where a lot of old buildings were like within 15 feet of, of the front property line, and that complied with the zoning that was in effect back then. But for its own reasons, the city council said, well, let's increase the setback to 35, 40, 50 feet. So you'd have a neighborhood where almost all the lots were built on 15 feet from the sidewalk. And somebody had a lot and they wanted to build, but you gotta be 50 feet back. It's stupid, <laughs> okay? Um, it doesn't pass the smell test to do that. And, the, and the, 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 so if you have a situation where you have a number of variances, that's one of the reasons why I suggest the meetings between boards. Wait a minute, we've had six variances this year relating to this issue. That may be a suggestion that you've got a Belanger situation that the zoning is out of touch with reality. Thank you. Yeah. Is, is there any best way to record the voting of the five points in the variance? Everybody discusses it. You do not vote. Paul Sanderson, when I did this lecture last fall with him, um, Paul Sanderson did a segment on the, using the individual criteria to vote. And he showed using the scorecard how you could have a situation where you would have a board vote so that some of the, that each of the criteria got a majority, but they were all a different majority. And so that's not the way the zoning board is supposed to act. You're supposed to look at it as a whole, discuss it, and then among the board, try to create a decision that says, as to spirit and intent of the ordinance, we find, boom. As to uh, property values, we find. As to not being contrary to public interest, we find. Okay. And then the board votes on that as a whole. The, the, the uh, I always get, get a rise out of people when I say this, so I probably will again, but the, the board I've sat on for years, we don't, we don't take a vote the same night as the hearing. We have, as Dan said, you don't want to write the decision before you've had the hearing. That really can't constitute prejudgment. But, but we usually take a week or two weeks between the hearing and, and the deliberations. And in the meantime, the chair assigns one person to draft a proposed motion, including the reasoning and the conditions. And, you know, then we get to the deliberations and you know, we can scratch out a paragraph if we don't agree with it or whatever, but then we have a solid vote on the whole thing at the end. And I, and I strongly, you know, I think I agree with Dan, that's the way you do it, and not separate votes on each criteria. No, I, I, I and again, I wish I had Paul's, um, Paul is retired now from NHMA, but he had a nice little chart that oh, showed how, that. yeah, <laughs> he, he, this, he had a nice little chart that showed how this just doesn't work when you vote on the individual criteria. And it really is not, that's not the vote, okay? Um, and, and I mean, you look at, <coughs> one of the things that always gets me is, you know, it's contrary to the spirit and intent of the ordinance because the ordinance prohibits the use. Duh, why am I applying for variance? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's not an answer to that question. Okay, what do you look at though? You look at the purpose statement, 
You look at similar uses that are allowed, similar conditions that are allowed. What's the conditions in the neighborhood? Okay, that shows the spirit and intent of the ordinance, not the fact that it's prohibited use. Okay. Can you speak to uh, the, the practice of the planning board being the responsible body to determine if an application is acceptable according to their zoning ordinance? To the ZBA? The planning board making it being the body to determine if what's being proposed through an application fits within their zoning ordinance well I, like i said there's a there's, i know of at least two towns up north where they do that all the time every single application for anything yeah I, even I, a building permit goes to the planning board i and, can think of at least one town yeah. but uh south of north I, there there is at least, i mean it's nice to have input but there is at least one caution on that and, and um, that's the, the Winslow versus Holderness case where um, a member of the planning board uh, appeared at the zoning board hearing um, and testified either in favor or in opposition to the zoning board deliberations. Then it went to the planning board for site plan review and he was disqualified because he'd already he'd prejudged it. So, if, if the planning board looks at it and says is the application complete and that's all they're saying they're not making a substantive judgment on the validity of the application but well I guess I just yeah. think you know I went over that I went over that new statute that talks about mm -hmm. the, the, the aspects of the decision of the planning board that are appealable to the zoning board and and I guess I think I think in those towns that have zoning administrators it's much better to have the zoning administrator making that decision then you don't get into that problem right uh but you know again i you know they're planning there are towns where the planning board does it and they seem to work uh mm -hmm. as long as you avoid the uh, conflicts issues is it advisable to set it up that way well you know i uh, it depends on how much the, the uh, town w wants to spend uh, to have somebody have a, be the zoning administrator, I think. And how much they want to spend in legal fees. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, mean, I mean, it can work. Yeah. I don't think it's illegal, per se, by, by any means. To add to your, co to add to your comment, uh, on the Hebron case that was brought up, one of the things that happened in Hebron was there was a petition that went around prior to the hearings uh, in deference to the developer not wanting it to happen. Members of both zoning and planning boards signed that petition. That sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> it was a we agree on that. <laughs> it was a very difficult idea because we had a very hard time finding people to serve on those boards that hadn't signed the petition. Right. Is it, uh, are you from Hebron? I'm from Hebron. Yeah. And I was deeply involved. I was a selectman. I was very, uh, I was very impressed that Jay Whitelaw was able to uh, get that decision upheld, frankly, because I read it in advance and I said, wow, this is, it's going to take, <laughs> it's going to take uh, some work to get this decision upheld. I mean, the other things that zoning boards used to do, that, that they would, you know, take testimony and the chairman would stand up, okay, now how many in the audience think we should grant the variance? <laughs> Don't well, do that. That is another issue. I, I had a case, one of, one of the few cases where I was not representing the municipality in the past 10 years. Uh, I was representing some friends of mine <laughs> in a town that we don't represent. But, uh, you know, it had, been, it had been discussed thoroughly on the local list serve. And, and not in the not in the public hearing context. And you know, I said, I, I thought that was a good complaint. I mean, the, the, the basically been prejudged by the in the uh, in the press, so to speak. Um, and, and and the board members have been participating in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, I I just think that's a bad practice. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, publicity. This isn't a, you know a criminal trial like we're going to move the venue or something like that, but board members need to just say no thanks you know I had out there don't blab on one of my slides and I mean I I've been chairman of planning boards I've been members of planning boards and people come up to me well what do you think you know, I'm sorry I like you but we're not going to talk let's talk about the weather mm -hmm. okay you had a question yeah could you you talked a little bit about public access and, 
And what came to mind is a lot of times when they try to get these developers to develop in some land or they got a cluster development or whatever, if there was an existing snowmobile trail in the back of it or something, a lot of times the planning board will try to, well, we want to make sure that we have that trail in the back. Now, I, I think I heard you said that that's not a good thing. No, I, I, what I'm saying is, is that, I mean, if, if somebody can sense it's a good thing, okay, but make sure that it's noted that the developer offered, okay, that would be a good thing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, yeah, what I'm saying is that if you're talking about things where you're requiring the developer to provide access along or across the property, you need a reason. Um, well, we have a development coming out that we're working on now where there's an existing church and there's some houses going to be built. And there's a lot of talk about how they think that, well, they can get to this land by going over the other land to maintain it, but it's part of the development. And that kind of comes in this snowmobile trail there, too. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, you don't want to end up with somebody streaming a piano wire across a snowmobile trail sure. because it's, you know. Um, the, the, there is a, there's a discussion in my, uh, in my uh, materials that on a case that that's the, the Coons case, which is a U.S. Supreme Court decision, where I go back and quote one of the paragraphs from the 77 land best case that Van talked about. And, and I'm sort of asking the question, I mean, because Justice Batchelder had, it's a, sort of a famous paragraph among land use lawyers, because it says, we can imagine a situation where a proper application of the uh, rational nexus test might nevertheless result in an uh, uh, extraordinary or, or, or uh, uh, what's the word, use of, uh, or, or uh, a uh, undesirable expenditure of public funds. In other words, I mean, you, you know, you take your, uh, your, your all other things being equal type example, which all other things never are equal, but let's suppose you have four equally developable parcels all fronting on a a road which is inadequate and you know all of the things being equal the rational nexus test would say you can charge only one of those developers only a quarter of the cost but then but then you say well but the taxpayers can't afford the other other three quarters of the cost so uh, one thing batch elder says well you still have the option of saying it's scattered and premature and, and, and but but the, but the question is and, 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 and nothing, is, nothing he says in that, in that paragraph is the developer might unilaterally offer to bear more of the cost. Yeah, but, what you, but what do you do as a board? You, what you can't do as a board is say, well, we can really legally only allow you to uh, or, or charge you a quarter of the cost of this road upgrade. But on the other hand, we're not going to uh, approve it unless you voluntarily agree to pay more than that. Uh, <laughs> you do not want that kind of talk on the record. Uh, you know, you make a decision based on the law, then if they see that decision and say, well, you know, I'll come back and voluntarily offer to do more, then they, they have the authority to do that. And you, you, and you make it clear in the record that it is a volunteer. Read, read Bernie's comments on the Coons case because that, the Coons case deals pretty clearly with that type of Can you yeah. suggest a volunteer thing? Would you volunteer to donate that land for snowmobile? Is that a bad thing? To, 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 for the board to, to, to make that suggestion? Yeah. No, I don't think that, unless it's, uh, you know, unless it's something. Unless it's coercive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, no, that already exists. Ola could give them a letter to the mouth or whatever, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. There's, uh, so, if you have like questions, <laughs> further questions, you may have questions in this. Thank you. Thank you. And mine is too. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, Thank you very much. I got to go in because I got to get home before. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, well, it's gone. Crook TV.